It is 6.02, so I will introduce our special guest now. And when I say special, this one is very special to me. It is Huga. She is a Chilean singer, chess player, songwriter, and artist. She has millions of views on YouTube for her music videos, some of which we're going to get a chance to see today. I'm also personally very grateful to Huga because she's provided the intro music to the U.S. Chess Podcast Ladies' Night which won the Chess Journalist of America Award for Best Podcast, Best Chess Podcast, two years in a row. And many thanks to Huga, of course, for that. She's performed on the biggest chess stages in the world, from the World Chess Championship to the Olympiad. She's also a Make-A-Wish ambassador and a huge advocate to growing chess to everyone, which is why I'm so happy that she accepted our invitation to the Girls Club Room. So a big welcome to Huga. Hello, everyone. Hello, girls. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you so much, Jen and US Chess and US Chess Women for this invitation. I really, really look forward to share with you my creative process and this journey of mixing chess and music and art. Wonderful. So the cool thing about Huga is that her music is very inspired from actual chess and she's a very serious chess player herself so you're if you haven't listened to them before you're going to notice that quite quickly i think i i can't say which my favorite is because i love so many of huga's songs and i have a special place for o capablanca because it's our ladies night intro but this might be my other favorite as it's been particularly pertinent during these times so um we're gonna take a quick listen at 30 seconds or so of this, and then she's going to show the game that inspired this song. Today, I won't close my eyes. So beautiful. It's, I couldn't stop listening to it. So who is going to give us the inside scoop about what inspired that song? Well, that song, I will talk a little bit about what inspired me first, and then I will talk about the game and I will show you some critical positions and that sequence, the chess sequence. If you watch the, the video completely, you will see the, a chess sequence in which an isolated pawn gets to advance and um, promote. Yes. The isolated pawn promoted, and it's inspired in a beautiful classical game between world champion Vasily Smyslov and Anatoly Karpov in 1971. I was studying with my with my coach at once. At some point, I wanted to play the the pan of attack uh, against the Karokan defense. I didn't really. I, I now I play the exchange variation against the Karokan. <laughs> But um, I was studying a lot of uh, queens can be declined positions and um, other other isolated pawns. I, I found it so fascinating, you know, this concept of the isolated pawn and that some people loved to play with an isolated pawn and some others were like avoiding by all means to have an isolated pawn. I play actually against Sicilia and I play the Alapin variation. And in many cases, I have to deal with having an isolated pawn. And in some other variations, I really try to avoid having an isolated one because it's so crazy, it's so beautiful, so inspiring that the most weak piece, so to say, in the board, you know, an isolated pawn in the middle of the chessboard with, that is defenseless, that is being blocked, that is, um, you know, the, the prey for all the attacks possible, can uh, move forward from being the weakest piece to becoming a, a piece of attack and actually 
going beyond the eighth rank, seventh sky of chess players and becoming a queen. So it's a real transformation, something even like alchemical, you know? The only chess piece that can transform into another is the pawn. And it's also something very beautiful that you can have more than one queen in the chessboard. You know, you can have so many queens as pawns you can, you can promote. And I find that, that this concept is very feminist, you know, that like women support women. Because in this, <laughs> in this chess game, actually, the queen, you will see, sacrifices itself and then is reborn on the isolated pawn some moves afterwards. So I, I found it so poetical that it really moved me to make a song about this and a video that illustrates this beauty, you know, from the gloomy sensation of the pawn to the magical, spectacular, blooming sensation of becoming a queen. So I will show you um, the game, a little bit of the game. So this game uh, starts with an English opening. Smyslov is with white, Karpov is with black. This is. So um, very early in the game, the isolated pawn position arises. And as you see, the pawn is already blocked by a black knight. And uh, in one of the first parts of the video, I show this, I illustrate this, like two figures like, that are representing Smyslov and Karpov, you know, in a, in a isolated room. And there are no pieces in the chessboard, but only the isolated pawn and the black knight blocking it. Because I feel that it's a very symbolic and um, powerful way to represent the isolation and the blockade of the isolated pawn. So in my music videos, I look for these symbols that are very concrete and very uh, direct to illustrate the isolation. So we continue in the game. These uh, positions may arise from uh, the variations that we already said, you know. Okay, and here is a very important move that I want to show that A3 is preventing the knight from jumping the maneuver from uh, B4 to D5. That is the, the strong blockading maneuver that usually you want uh, white ones, so black ones to make against the pawn to be able to attack it properly. But with a3, this is prevented, okay? So uh, bishop c2 also is uh, preparing the, the battery, you know, with the next move, uh, queen d3. It's pointing uh, to the h7 point. If this knight was eliminated, um, the battery will be giving checkmate. So uh, that's something that black already has to um, be careful with. So rook c8, this move, it's a very strange move for two, um, for two world chess champions to overlook because Smyslov also didn't uh, take advantage of this mistake by Karpov. Uh, we want to ask you with Jen, we want to ask you why do you think this move is so inaccurate and which uh, pos tactical possibility does this move give to White, to Smyslov, uh, to play now? We will give you some uh, some minutes to think about it and to answer the poll. Yeah, you know, I learned this when I was a kid and I was told that it's called the Grandmaster Trap because it's such a elaborate trap that even the top players in the world missed it. Yes. So I, I want to tell you while you're thinking, so we don't move forward in the game, I want to show, I want to tell you something about the the music video because I, my songs, when I compose the song, I also um, produce the music. I write the song lyrics, the, the, the chords, the music. Then I co-produce the music with a friend of mine. We, we make the, the arrangements together. And then I write the scripts and I take all the creative decisions of the music video with the director of the video. And it depends on the style of the song and the, and the story we want to represent that is like a parallel story to the story that you're listening in the lyrics. So that makes that the song and the video together are like a, a small short film and it's really powerful the way that they combine. So in the music video, you can see that the isolated phone has a scar in the middle of its forehead and the scar is made of gold. And what represents 
uh, that scar made of gold is inspired by a Japanese traditional art called Kintsugi. And that art is um, a very ancient art in which when a porcelain, a plate or a vase or a very important uh, porcelain art is broken, falls down and just breaks into pieces, instead of throwing it away to the garbage, what they do is to glue it back together. But instead of gluing it with glue and trying that it doesn't appear that it was broken, they glue it with gold. So you can see all the scars and all the pieces where it was broken. And I feel that that is a way of honoring your past, your experience when you were broken and just like show it without shame. And um, I felt that the, the weakness of the isolated one is what makes it stronger and so special and which uh, transforms afterwards in the video, the scar transforms into the crown of the queen when it promotes. So uh, all the music videos are full of these little symbols and uh, things that I look forward that you, that you discover and that you let me know in your comments on YouTube or uh, through my website, you can uh, let me know. I would uh, very much appreciate if you let me know if you discover any hidden metaphors in the music videos. Yeah, that's amazing. I didn't know that full story either. Um, I'm going to unmute a couple people to give their ideas in this position, um, starting with uh, Cicera. And feel free to use the raise hand if you want to be unmuted as well. Cicera, what would you play here as um, white? Um, I would play G4. Because um, I was thinking between uh, Bishop G5 and G4. I don't like Bishop G5, it allows G6 to be blocked. So I thought G4 was better. And um, plus, like, oh. Oh, go, go ahead. I thought you were done. Uh, um, also, uh, if Black plays H6, it's creating a weakness for himself. Okay. Um, Huga, do you want to reply to that? Yes, I think uh, that uh, your, your thought of uh, playing uh, G4, I imagine that you want uh, to play it with the idea of playing afterwards G5, like to, to make the knight go away from the defense. Yes, yeah, and yes. They, that's why so, uh, yes, G4. like uh, well, bishop g5 is the, is the main idea and it's the move actually that uh, Smyslov played. Um, okay. Ananya, um, do you want to give your answer? Yes, so I was thinking d5 as my answer because the knight cannot take because his queen takes h7 and 8, and so the pawn has to take. And then now, after the pawn takes, I was thinking knight takes, but then the queen can take, so that, so that doesn't work. So in, maybe I was thinking um, bishop b3 as a move, but I also think rook d1 wins because you're turning knight takes d5, and if knight takes d5, again, there's queen takes h7. So the queen has to take on d5. And then I think you can just trade and be up the pawn in my, it, it, um, uh, be up the pawn with that. Great, great idea, Ananya. I, I, who is going to go a little bit into the analysis? There were some aspects of that you missed, but um, overall you got a, a great direction there. Um, incredible move. Anybody who got D5, um, show me a thumbs up or a wave. Great job. Incredibly creative move. Um, Bernice, what were you going to say? You have your hand raised. Were you going to say D5 or Bishop G5? Bishop to G5. Uh, okay, that was what was played in the game. Very good move, but not as good as the Grandmaster Trap, which I think Kuga will describe now. Yes, well, Bishop G5 is very good move, but it allows uh, Black to defend here with uh, G6 also, that we will see in the game. But here, the right move uh, was exactly D5. Why? Because what happens, well, the Knight cannot take, right? Because it would be checkmate, right? So that's not possible. So uh, white is um, forced to play pawn takes. And that move allows the following combination that's very beautiful. If uh, rook takes, so bishop g5, and uh, you're threatening here the checkmate. And if queen takes, then you run into also the pin you know, 
Um, and then, H6, what happens? Comment? I mean, if G6, what happens? If pawn to uh, G6? G6 yeah. Uh, you take here. And there is a pin here. And, uh, and white will win a piece. If you, if you don't mind going back to rook c8, I just wanted to show somebody had a really good question in the chat and I just wanted to address it. Um, they, they were saying that after rook c8, d5, double x clam, um, if, if we play d5 instead, the double x clam move. Now, after pawn takes d5, um, I think we, there, the, the right move here is bishop g5, right? Oh, okay, yes, sorry. I, I confused the, the move order because now bishop uh, g5 is the, is the real threat. I, I, I made a, a little too soon uh, the move order. Uh, rook uh, takes d7 is the threat. Yes. Yes, exactly. And now, but yeah, you, you know, the, the idea is just that after h6, bishop f6, queen h7 mate, so that's beautiful. And if g6, now this is where the gorgeous move comes in, right, Huga? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I love that. I love yes. that. So this was not played. And instead, um, bishop g5 right away, which honestly is like the move that most people would play, right? Yes. Also, wait. So the, the move was like, the game was like this. Smithlock uh, missed also the opportunity of playing d5. And uh, he played this move that is also good, but it allows the defense of the checkmate. And then uh, we will move forward a little bit in the game because we want to go to the critical position in which uh, concerns us that was inspired for the music video and for the, for the chess sequence in the, in the song. And by the way, for those of you who are wondering, the mistake was for um, black was rook c8 because if Karpev had played g6 instead, the d5 idea wouldn't have worked, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So here I want to show that this, uh, this move, uh, bishop b3, is a very important move because it a, a, it's, um, unblocks the pawn that is being blocked by the black queen, but queens are not a good blockading piece. If you know a little bit about uh, chess, uh, about isolated pawn uh, concepts or how to fight against them, you will see usually that the queen is not the best blockading piece because it can run into threats very easily. And here, this move, queen is a, a, a trying to, um, you know, defend the king and it's not such a, a good move in spite that he's trying to coordinate with this bishop and like possible threats. The problem is that you can see the x-rays of the rook and queen on the e-file and this rook is unprotected. So much better would have been queen d7 to protect the back rank. You will see the troubles that Smyslov got into, sorry, that Karpov got into because of not protecting his back rank with this bishop here, you know, this bishop is very important here. So, queen h5, and already the march of the pawn, you know, he, he gets the opportunity, he seizes the moment, you know, the, the, the opportunity to start advancing and not really being blockaded again, you know. The knight has to retreat, the pawn keeps on as an unstoppable hero, the rook tries to um, avoid getting, you know, the the fourchette here, the fork, you know, the it, that this would be very uh, bad. So um, black goes to a active square with the rook, but on the other hand, he's weakening also his back rank. The pawn keeps on marching towards the eighth rank, the seventh sky. Only move for the rook. That rook, you see, it's totally trapped. Mm -hmm. And this move, this glorious move, look, is threatening the bishop and also threatening entering the back rank on b8. So this move is really strong. It's a beautiful, careful, you know, small, silent move with the queen, but it's really devastating. Already black is in a very, very lost position. What does black do? He comes with the bishop. Queen enters the back rank, threatening this knight. Look at this knight. How can this knight go anywhere? It's pinned, you know. 
So the queen just has to take the bishop. Uh, that knight is defenseless. Check. He covers with the bishop. And this is a very subtle, beautiful move. You know, now it's already lost for, um, for black. He's a piece down. And uh, being a piece down against world champion Vasily Smyslov, I don't think it's very worth it. But on the other hand, Smyslov took this precaution and didn't just make the, the final combination. He just moves the rook to e3 because why? Because he doesn't want that bishop takes, the bishop takes the knight here and he will get double pawns. And that would give a little compensation for black to maybe try to make any kind of counter, counter play. But he just wants to avoid. He knows that black doesn't have anything. And he just says, no, you know what? My position is so glorious that I just will put my rook here and protect my knight with my rook. So um, Karpov does what he can. And now the beautiful sacrifice of the queen. Queen takes, queen takes, and now the pawn becomes a queen. And in this moment in the promotion, Karpov resigned because he's already a piece down, a whole knight down. And against Mislov, he knew that he didn't have a chance. So our okay. isolated pawn promoted. Amazing game. I love that game so much. And, you know, before I, I knew that it was the inspiration to the song, I just knew the trap. I didn't know the game behind it. Um, I'm going to show the, the, uh, the next part of the music video before we move on to the next thing, right? You wanted to show another 30 seconds of the pawn queening? Okay. Okay, sure. Yes, let's do that. Wow, it's just so amazing to see the game and then see the exact moves play on the screen, right? <laughs> now you recognize exactly the sequence. Oh, so beautiful. Oh, look, we have um, Tatev Abrahamian in the chat. Hello to Tatev. Hello, Welcome. Tatev. <laughs> we always have um, some interesting um, people popping by the chat. So one more of your songs we were going to show, right, Huga? Yes, we're going to show my most recent release song called Immortal Game. I released it for the International Chess Day. Um, I think you may spot a really big chess grandmaster star in the video that I'm very honored that uh, appeared in the video. And um, this song, I just want to say that it was um, impulsed, the, the inspiration to make this song came because of the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, in United States, but also it, uh, you know, it uh, had repercussion in, I'm from Chile, in my country, and all over the world, there is racism, there is uh, discrimination. All right, let's listen to a little piece of it, and then we can uh, talk a little bit more about that, and then break up into smaller groups, which I'm really excited about. So let's play a few bars of this first, though.
All right. Who saw the very famous player in that clip? A lot of people did in the uh, in the comments already. Although somebody also rep mentioned, Robin Ranson mentioned Robert Katendi. No, they're my friends. They're um, friends uh, that are from the United States and Italy, that they live here in Budapest. They're friends from Poland, from uh, different countries, um, Israel, um, many, many countries, the, the people that are here, Hungary, of course. And yes, it's Judith Polgar in the music video. She appears playing with uh, Laszlo Hasai, that was one of her first chess coaches when she was small and has become one of my best friends here in Budapest. He's an amazing man. He's a wonderful theorician of chess. And uh, also Judith's daughter appeared, Hannah Font. And uh, oh, she's wow. playing. It's very beautiful to have Judith Polgar playing against her daughter, teaching her daughter chess and playing, and also sharing a beautiful game with her first chess coach after like 30 years without playing a chess game with him. So. Yeah, well, Judith is, is the best, you know, like, it's like, it's a dream come true to have yeah. Judith Polgar just sharing a music video. I was just so happy that I couldn't, you know, I, I was directing the video and producing the video. And I was just like, in a cloud of happiness. I couldn't believe this, that uh, she, she was sharing that uh, with us. I was thinking it'd be really fun, and I have talked to Huga about this before, um, that we would all have a challenge in breakout rooms. So the challenge is talk with the people in your breakout room about if you had to make a song about chess, what would it be about? I was at a lot of breakout rooms. I was hopping around and I heard so many good ideas. I'm just gonna go for a couple of them and let some people, if you raise your hand if you wanna talk about your idea. Um, but we had people talking about queen sacrifices, um, the Sicilian, what chess has done for their life, um, uh, work end games. Uh, let me let me call on Evie. Evie, you have a you want to show us share with us? When I was in my breakout room, I decided that if I was going to create a music video, I would make it about the uniqueness of knights because they are different. They don't move in the same way as all the other pieces, and they can hop over things. And I really like that they're different from every other piece. So I and they're also my favorite piece. So I would create a song about them. Amazing. I love that. And um, somebody else mentioned the octopus night from another class. Mm. Another great idea. I know I that night. <laughs> um, Anastasia? Um, so my idea was like um, for a music video, like the danger, like how dangerous um, minor pieces can be once they come together. Because I played the Vigana Gambit sometimes and um, I feel like that is um, an opening where you bring in a lot of minor pieces, like knights necessarily, and um, they can be deadly if you don't handle it um, correctly. The danger of minor pieces uh, coordinating together. I yes. love that. That's, That's so great. Cool. That's great. And with Evie, we were in the same uh, breakout room, and uh, she was telling me, I was asking her, okay, but for you, the knight, the uniqueness of the knight, would you re represent the knight as a horse or as the man that rides the horse, that it's the actual knight? And she was telling me as the man that rides the horse. So it's a very interesting character, you know, this man that is aligned with this, with this horse, you know, and has a, it's, a, it's in the chess board, is represented as a, as a horse, but it's actually a man. So it's very interesting. And she wanted to make it in a classical music style. So it was very, very beautiful to, to develop that idea. Amazing. Yes. Great idea. I, I'm, I'm not, I can't say that I'm surprised by the creativity of this group. Cicero, you're the last one to share your chess song with us. And then we're going to go to general Q and a, um, Cicero. I was thinking like, you know, pawns that are right next to each other. Cause like I've played a lot of end games. Like when my opponent has a rook and I have two pawns that are connected, mm -hmm. like I usually win the game. Or like when my opponent has a queen and I'm like near the end and the king's all the way on the other side, then my king's like coming close to the pawns, then like I win though. Yeah, connected pawns, connected pass pawns or hanging pawns also. Are, I think I will make like a trilogy of, of pawns, you know, the isolated pawn, the pass pawn, the hanging pawns. There are so many pawns that are so inspiring. I love pawns. So I see that the, you girls have uh, some questions and some of you have to go. So if you want, we can already uh, make the Q&A.
Yes, Anika is going to be our first um, question. Uh, so my question is, what's the best text or life advice you've ever gotten from someone or that you've thought of yourself for, your, for yourself? Chess advice? Uh, chess or life advice. Chess or life advice, yes. Um, I actually got it from, well, I have had many, I, I guess, but um, I'm really happy to say that I shared a lot of time with Boris Pasky. You know about Boris Pasky, right? Uh, the world champion that was defeated by Bobby Fischer back in 1972. Uh, I shared a lot of time with him like 10 years ago and also after he had a stroke, unfortunately. But uh, there is something that he told me that I feel that it's a chess advice and a life advice at the same time. That is very strong and has kept with me all this time that is never be in panic. You really, really, he said, never be in panic. <laughs> and uh, I think that you can apply that uh, always. You have to keep that in mind that in any position, even if you're losing the game or you feel that you're totally stressed out or there is no way out, you just have to breathe, you know, keep calm and search for the possibilities and deal with the situation in the most calm and pacific way inside, like harmonize yourself to be able to see what is really happening. Because when you enter in panic, you see everything is gloomy and everything is terrible. So yes, that's a very good advice that I wanted to share with you. Oh, thank you, Anika. Um, Via, your question. Uh, um, do you like online chess or do you like on the board chess, like playing on the board, reading books more? Which one do you like more? I love both, actually. I love to play online chess. I love to play five plus five mainly, or 10 without increment, or 10 plus five. Those are, I think, my favorite time controls online. But I love to play chess tournaments and the games that last six, seven hours. Like I really, really enjoy classical tournaments when you have all day just to prepare for the game and really prepare for the openings of your opponent and just after the game, spend time analyzing your mistakes or you know all the game with the score sheet and putting it in stockfish and realizing with your chess friends the good moves and what you can learn from the game i think that classical chess and also you get to uh, share with people and meet a lot of new chess friends and enjoy the, the atmosphere of the tournaments many times it's really uh, enjoyable just dedicate a whole week to play chess and concentrate on your tournament, I think it's fascinating. So I love both. I love that answer. Alyssa <laughs> and Jocelyn, um, share your camera and say hi and your question. Okay, hi. Um, which one do you like most, being a singer or a chess player? Oh, that's a good one. Um, I think being a singer because I'm a musician and I studied composing and I realized that I wanted to be a singer and a songwriter when I was like about four years old. So I've dedicated mainly all my life to music as a profession. But also uh, I consider myself an artist. I think that I not only express myself as a singer or a songwriter, but also as a script writer, as a conceptual artist. And there are many other art projects that I'm developing to be able to express better my my thoughts, my ideas, but uh, I'm dedicating all my creativity to chess. And I, I, I feel that I'm just getting started because I, I feel that it's an area that I can explore so much. But in doing so, I need to play chess. I, I, it's my passion, you know, so uh, I can't do one thing or the other. I just have to combine both all the time to be happy. <laughs> Oh, that's amazing. Um, <laughs> Laurel, your, your question. Hello, uh, I was wondering what platform do you use normally to uh, make your chess videos? I'd like to animate them. Yes, I, I don't do them myself. I work with an amazing team. Uh, I mean, the one that you saw, the Immortal game that we, uh, that we filmed at the bar, it's uh, uh, a different kind of video, you know? I, I guess you yeah. mean the the animation ones, right? Uh, yeah. Yes, I work with a very professional team in Chile right. that is called Fields TV and it's an animation design studio. 
and the, the creator of the video is Sebastián Collazo, that is the director of the video, and me. And we take, we write the script together, we make the storyboard, and then we realize which references and which kind of art we want. And then we ally with different illustrators and artists, which uh, have the style that we want for each video. You see that the Capa Blanca video yeah. has an illustration style that is very different from the isolated one or the one that I'm going to do now, the open files. All of them are very different. So uh, we take the art decisions. Um, and depending on the style, we ally with different illustrators and then we work on the whole video together, the three of us. But uh, I always do it with uh, Fields TV, that is an animation design studio in Chile. Nice, wow. Yeah. Cool. Um, Sarah. <laughs> no, they're wonderful, they're just genius, so I'm very lucky to, to have such a wonderful team that works with me. Actually, the tactical video that was filmed was also directed by, by Sebastián Collazo. And uh, we also planned this together, but it was filmed. So uh, that was also very exciting to be able to act on the video. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, Sarah, did you, I think you unmuted yourself, right, Sarah? There you are. Yes. My question was, how do you balance your musical life and your chess life? It's a very good question, Sarah. <laughs> well, I, I am constantly learning to do it because I train, I, I improve my chess level, I, um, I develop my, my songs, I write my songs, but I also have to rehearse them with the guitar, singing, and I also have to make a lot of uh, email work, design work, a lot of meetings that has to have to do with the music and the chess. And uh, there are plenty of other activities that are related to my projects that I have to combine. Usually this year hasn't been of much performing because of the pandemic, but uh, last year it was much more of uh, performing concerts and rehearsing and uh, making the live presentations with all the with all the different preparations that uh, that are needed for that, and I'm looking forward to to present all these chess songs that are will be an album or maybe more than one, but a, a chess songs album is coming, and many more music videos are coming, and uh, many other chess projects are coming. So I look forward to to share them with you as soon as possible, and hopefully live in United States. <laughs> Amazing. We have so many um, singers and musicians. By the way, Sarah, I've seen your, your, her mom is very active in the chess community too. She runs something called Chess Girls DC and she's always posting these amazing photos of Sarah performing. So um, Sarah also has to combine chess and music. Um, Laurel had another question, which I really liked. I just want to ask real quick because I don't think I know this about you. She asked, um, who's your musical idol? Oof, too many, too <laughs> many girls. When I was a, a little girl, my first musical idol, I think, was Madonna. Madonna in the 90s. And Cyndi Lauper, probably. Then it was Janis Joplin. And the, the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, the classical rock. Then I started composing and I started uh, listening to a lot of classical music, baroque music, post-romantic music. So uh, Gustav Mahler, Beethoven, Bach, you know, uh, Franz Schubert, a lot of classical music that I sing also. I, I started uh, learning opera. I can sing opera in German and Italian. And then I started uh, making a show, a tribute show of Edith Piaf, singing all the French songs of the 50s, you know. And I was touring with that. I was living in Buenos Aires. I've had a very different uh, styles uh, explored in my in my own albums. My songs before were in Spanish. My native uh, language is Spanish. I'm from Chile. And uh, it's only been three years that I'm writing songs in English and about chess, but I have several albums before that. I was living in Easter Island in Polynesia and exploring that culture. So, so much music that I love, I couldn't tell you. But my biggest uh, idol, music idol, and artist uh, of all times is David Bowie. 
David Bowie, <laughs> wow, amazing choice. Um, Anaya, you, you I, I don't see you, but can you please unmute yourself and ask your question? Oh, there you are. I got you, yeah. Anaya. Okay, yeah. So um, my question was, did you know that you were gonna get fame? How'd you feel when you got it? And what does fame mean to you? Hmm. Wow, good question. Um, I don't feel that I'm famous. I'm not a famous person. I hope that my music uh, gets more and more audience and that more people reach to it, chess players and non-chess players, because I feel that, uh, that uh, my songs are inviting more people to, to uh, come to the, the chess world, to the chess universe in a playful way. But uh, I don't feel that I'm a famous person. I don't feel that my private life is exposed. I don't feel um, in my life I have followers, but uh, I don't feel that I'm a famous person. I'm very happy that uh, people uh, are happy with my work and uh, value my work. And I'm looking forward to, to grow with my, with my art. <laughs> okay, Amazing. thank you. Um, Annalise, uh, what was your question? You want to mute yourself? My question was, what was your, what is your favorite music video or like song that you've ever made? Of mine? Yes. Oof, that's a very difficult question because each song and each video for me is like a, it's like a baby, you know? <laughs> It's uh, such so much care, so much work, so much dedication. Um, oh my God, no, I cannot. I don't have a favorite one actually. I, I really love them all because they represent uh, different emotions, different parts of me, different thoughts, ideas that are very deep inside of me and when they are there and I, I can release them and they already not belong to me but belong to everyone. So uh, I, I love them all. <laughs> and um, we're just going to take a couple more questions. Thank you so much for staying late, Huga. We really appreciate it. Anastasia, um, what's your question? Um, my question was, do you play any instruments? Yes, I play the guitar. I play uh, the ukulele from Tahiti, not the Hawaiian one, but the Tahitian one. It's a little different. And I play the piano, not very well because I haven't been rehearsing the last years because I don't have a piano here in Europe. But uh, I usually compose with piano and, and have some songs of mine in piano. And uh, it has been very important to, to know piano, to be able to compose and to understand harmony, how it works. Thank you. Um, Bernice? Bernice, did you have a question? Yeah. Um, how old were you when you started chess? Chess? Well, I'm 35 years old now. I started uh, playing chess at when I was nine. I saw my father playing with his friends and I asked some questions and I learned and then I started playing with him and with some sons of my father's friends. And um, I never practiced too much, but I always loved it. I, I was always like mesmerized by it, like very intrigued by it and very fascinated by it because of its beauty, because of its difficulty, because of the movement of the pieces. I felt very attracted to it, but I never uh, really practiced it in a more serious level. And I sometimes played chess tournaments with my father, like an activity because my father is a big chess fan. And uh, then I started, uh, when I was 20, I started working with the Chilean Chess Foundation and with many chess projects to promote uh, chess at an educational level, at a cultural level, uh, with uh, book publications in my country and with other uh, um, foundations in other parts of the world. I was very much into promoting chess as a social skill, as a, an educational tool. But I was developing my music career in parallel. I wasn't mixing both. But at some point in my life, I just realized that to be happy and to feel fulfilled, I needed to mix my two biggest passions in life, was chess and music, and to find a way to, to mix them up. <laughs> Brilliant. I think that's such an amazing inspirational story that like when you, when you have two things that you're good at and you merge them, you become so unique. 
and there's just nobody like Kuga in the chess world. And I am such a big fan of your work and so glad that you were able to share your wisdom in time because I think that it's, it's really inspiring. There are so many ways that you can break new ground and do things in chess that nobody's done before. And you've really shown a new path to people, I think. Thank you so much, Jen, uh, for your support and for this space. I'm so, you cannot imagine how beautiful this experience has been for me to share with all you girls. Thank you so much for your questions. Thank you so much for your encouragement. Now I will read all the chat because I haven't been reading the chat while I talk to you to be concentrated. But I will read all your comments. And uh, if you want to tell me anything, you can, uh, you can post on my Instagram or you can uh, reach me on my website and uh, through email. Uh, please uh, keep in touch. And I really encourage you, if, you're, if you love chess and you're very young, just uh, explore your talents, explore your creativity, and you will find so many ways that are totally yours and totally unique of coming up with the chess and art expressions that are your soul, you know, because you are playing chess and you know chess. It's not something that is ornamental in a, a, a song or something. You are feeling, you're feeling chess. And that's how we can represent it in different ways of expression of art, you know, because art is, is uh, really important for the development of the soul. And I think when you practice chess, you're uh, making something that can be compared with yoga. You know, it's kind of a meditation. It's a self-knowledge space. You realize your weaknesses, uh, your own evolution, how you deal with your frustrations, how, are, how is your progress, how you understand things. So it's a, a, a self-knowledge tool as well as art. So I really encourage you to explore it. Wonderful. Well, I posted in the chat again that link to the open files. I'm so excited to see at least one of you guys featured in that. And um, thanks again to our wonderful guest, Tuga. And don't worry, um, I will um, send you anything you want if you miss something here, whether it's a video or a link or the game. Um, just ask me and I'll put it on our next email and our chess.com group. And yeah, thanks again to Huga and everybody for Thank coming. you.